Good morning, and welcome to Defiance Christian Church. We are glad you are with us this morning. I believe I can confidently say the last few weeks have been challenging and full of uncertainty. All of us are facing our own personal set of challenges. Maybe you're trying to be productive while working from home, or maybe you're helping kids with online learning for the first time. Maybe you're on the front lines fighting an unforeseen enemy or struggling not being able to see your kids or grandkids. Maybe you're laid off or maybe you're just plain scared for our country, your friends and family. First Peter 5 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So no, no matter what you are facing this morning, there is nothing that Christ can't handle. So let's come together and lift Christ up in worship this morning. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. I hope we have a good dinner. Dear Jesus, amen. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. During this difficult time, I have found I have something in common with David. In Psalm 86, he says, Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy upon me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. This reminds me of a song that I love. It's called, I Need Thee Every Hour. It's April 17th. We're a month into spring. We're filming this on Friday, if you didn't know. Um, and it's snowing. It's snowing outside. It's, it's spring and it's, it's snowing outside. And it's actually, it's really pretty. It's a, it's a beautiful winter spring reminder of what God does to our lives and to our hearts after salvation. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, as pure, innocent, as white as snow. Our sins, the sin sickness in our life, the guilt, the stain that sin lives in our life, leaves in our life, is gone because of what Jesus did. The forgiveness that he offers takes that guilt stain away. The new birth through the Holy Spirit makes us new, it makes us pure, it washes us white as snow. So as you come together as, as God's family in different homes across Ohio, Illinois, this morning, be reminded that because of Jesus' forgiveness that he offers through the cross, our lives are made pure, white as snow. Our sins are forgiven. And I want us to remember that to remember the gift that Jesus gave when he went to the cross. And so today we will celebrate communion together. And so I encourage you to get some, some bread, some juice, and take those emblems as a memorial to remember what Jesus Christ did. God, we thank you that your son brings about forgiveness. That because of what your son did on the cross, our lives are made new that our sins are forgiven and we're made white as snow. We're pure. We're innocent. We have no guilt and no stain of sin because of the forgiveness from your son. Thank you for that gift. May we never forget. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Every Sunday when we come together to worship, we have a portion of our service where we take the offering plates and we pass them to give myself, to give yourself an opportunity to give, an opportunity to give back to the Lord part of what he has blessed us with. And so we take that time this morning. I pray that if you've mailed in a check, if you stopped by the church and dropped off your giving, I pray that that money will, will go to further God's kingdom here on earth. Let's pray. God, thank you for 
uh, blessing us with, with, with jobs. And I pray for those who are out of work. I pray that we can safely return to work soon. God, we thank you for providing for our needs. And I pray for those who are struggling financially. I pray that you will help them to be able to provide for their families and get back on their feet. God, I pray for your kingdom. I pray that it can continue to grow and that people will continue to know who your son is and find salvation in him. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you were asked this question, how would you respond? I'll give you whatever you want. What do you ask for? What would you say? If someone came up to you and said, ask for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. Ask for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. It sounds kind of like the, the genie from the movie Aladdin. Maybe you're in quarantine and you've watched that movie recently. The, you know the story, Aladdin finds the lamp and he rubs the lamp and the genie comes out and says, what'll it be? You've got three wishes. Do you want to become a prince like Prince Ali Ababwa? What would you want? What, what, are the, what are the wishes? What would you, what would you ask for? And this, this actually happens. I don't think the, um, spoiler alert, I don't think the genie and the lamp, I don't think that's a, a, a truth full story. I I think that's, that's fun. It's fun, but I think it's made up. But this, this happened. This happened. God came to Solomon and asked him, ask for whatever you want me to give you, and I'll give it to you. How would you respond? I would ask God for what? What would you ask God for? If God came to you and said, I'll give you whatever you ask for, what would you want? You've got one thing. What would you ask for? Wow. The choices, the options here. What would I choose? Would I choose money? Well, this is a sermon and we're in church. Of course, we wouldn't choose money, but let's be serious. Let's be honest here. Would you, would you, choose, would you choose money? Would you choose power? I want to be, I want to be the most influential, important person in the world? Would you choose power? Would you choose fame? Would you choose good looks? Would you choose healing? Would you choose to get rid of COVID-19? To return to life as normal? What would you choose? See, God asks uh, Solomon this question. In 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, these uh, first and second Chronicles were written by Ezra to recap and show how God has worked through the nation uh, of Israel. And as we get into 2 Chronicles, Ezra is showing um, what God expects of his kings. And so 2 Chronicles retells the stories of first and second kings and adds a commentary to them. And so in 2 Chronicles, we'll, we'll look and we'll see how the kings behaved and how they did good in the eyes of God or how they did evil in the eyes of God and let their nation down. And we see that here in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Solomon, son of David, established himself firmly over his kingdom, for the Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. Now we're going to do a quick Bible quiz. Quick Bible quiz. Who was the first king of Israel, the first king of God's people? Well, if you answered Yahweh God, then you're correct. It's kind of a trick question. Because Yahweh was Israel's first king. But they looked around to what their friends had, their neighbors had, and they coveted what their neighbors had. If you, if you remember, all the way back in, in, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, Samuel was a prophet. And the people came to, to Samuel and said, we want a king. And Samuel says, you don't want a king. And they say, no, we really want a king. And Samuel says, that's a bad idea. He's going to take your sons and make them uh, be in his military. And he's going to take your sons and, and force them to work. And he's going to take your daughters. And he's going to take your livestock and your crops. And he's going to rule over you. And it's not going to be good. But the people looked at Samuel and said, no, we think this will be a great idea. We'll take a king. And God responds to him. He says to Samuel, he says, Samuel, don't worry. It's not you they've rejected. It's me. And when the day comes, you will cry out for help from the king that you've chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Essentially, God's saying, you really want this? Oh, yes. 
You're not going to like it. But I'll give you free will. And you can choose that. And when you're upset about your choice, it's almost like he said, don't come running to me. I told you so. It wasn't going to work out well. But, but God gives them what they want. The people refuse to listen to Samuel. No, we want a king over us. Listen, then we will be like all the other nations. 2 Samuel 8, 20. We'll be like everyone else with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. We want to be like everyone else. That's a disappointing time in history. And it proves as you read through the Old Testament that their desire to be like everyone else to forsake God as their king led them to sin. It hurt them as a nation. Huh. God knew the best plan. Nevertheless, okay, so, so first quiz. Uh, so first king of Israel is, is Yahweh God. Second king is Saul. He did okay for a while, but then that fell apart. Then David came along. David wasn't perfect. He was a man after God's own heart. He did well, but he had some, some struggles too. And one of those struggles was with Bathsheba, which brought about Solomon. And Solomon is now the king. And so Solomon takes the throne. And Solomon is, well, he, he does some things well, but he also, he also fails in some other areas. But God comes to Solomon and he offers him this, 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 this question. What would you want me to give you? This is the context. Solomon is king. He's established his kingdom. Uh, he speaks to Israel back in 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 1. He gathers them all together. He speaks to Israel. They, the whole assembly goes to the high place and they worship there. Solomon went up to the bronze altar before the Lord, the temp, uh, tent of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. Verse 7, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 7. That night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Wow. What would I choose? If God came to me and said, ask for whatever I want, and I'll give it to you, what would I choose? What would I ask for? Well, Solomon thought about this, and he responded. Solomon answered God, verse 8, You have shown great kindness to David my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, let your promise to my father David be confirmed. For you have made me king over a people who are as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Give me wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is facts. Knowledge is facts, truth, practical knowledge. A, a, a smart person who, who studies and reads and learns and knows facts. Wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make good judgments and decisions. Wisdom applies the knowledge in the best way. Knowledge is the ability to ace the multiple choice questions. Which one is it? A, B, or C? Maybe D. Wisdom takes that knowledge and applies it to the essay questions, where it's a little more challenging. Wisdom applies knowledge in the best way, where we look at those challenging questions where there's not really a right or wrong. It's, it's kind of a good, better, best, ish, ick, somewhere in here. And we have to make those tough calls. And wisdom, wisdom is what Solomon asked for, wisdom and knowledge. And God's excited. God said to Solomon, since this is your heart's desire, and you've not asked for wealth, possession, or honor, nor the death of your enemies, and since you've not asked for a long life, but for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people, whom I have made you king, therefore wisdom and knowledge will be given to you. And I will also give you wealth, possessions, and honor, such as no king before you has ever had, and none after you will have. Then Solomon went to Jerusalem from the high place of Gibeon, uh, from before the tent of meeting, and he reigned over Israel. He asked God for wisdom and knowledge, and God answered. God said, you know, I'll give you that, and I'll actually do more than that. I'll, I'll bless you beyond that because I like what you asked for, because God values wisdom. God values wisdom. The value of wisdom is, and, and if you're taking notes here and you notice on the bottom of the screen, I'm not filling in these blanks because I want you to honestly answer. What would you have asked for? If God asked you to ask me for anything, what would you say? Would you truly say that you want God to give you wisdom? Or would you put something else in the blank? Let's be honest here. 
what, what is the, the, the price tag, the value tag that I put to wisdom? The value of wisdom is what? Um, it's, it's important. It's somewhat important. It's not really that important. How, how, how valuable do you think wisdom is? If we put a bookmark here and we go over to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3. I want us to think about the value of wisdom. Why God would be so pleased with Solomon for asking for that. The value of wisdom and knowledge. Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verse 13 through 15. Blessed are those who find wisdom, who, those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies and nothing you desire can compare with her. That sounds like God's word elevates wisdom to an incredibly high, valuable, costly, important characteristic and attribute for us to pursue and to gain and to seek after and ask God for, for his provision that he would give that to us, that we need this. The value of wisdom is higher than, than, than money. It says here that it's better than, more profitable than silver. The value of wisdom is higher than, than good looks, athletic ability. We pursue money and athletic ability and good looks and jobs and status, but do we pursue wisdom? Do we study? Do we pursue knowledge? Do we, do we ask God for these things? Do we pursue these things? Or do we just look for things to, to benefit ourselves? See, when, when going back to, I, I, I pray, I pray that we put the, the value of wisdom is far greater than, than money. The value of wisdom is, is of the utmost importance. If we go back to first, or excuse me, Second Chronicles chapter one, I appreciate why Solomon asks for wisdom. Why would he ask for wisdom and knowledge? Look at chapter one, verse ten. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people, these people. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Solomon looks around and he sees the task before him, the job at hand. He says, I can't do this. I'm not going to be able to, I can't be a king of this nation. I'm not qualified for this. I'm going to need some help. And so he asks for wisdom and knowledge because he knows it benefits those that he leads. He asks for wisdom and knowledge because wisdom benefits those that we lead. When we, when we have wisdom, it blesses the circle of people that we're around. Now you might say to yourself, Mike, I'm not a king, let alone a king of God's people like Solomon. This is, this is, this is not me. This is, this is King Solomon. I'm just, I'm just Mike in Ohio. But look at the circle of people around you, the circle that you influence. Now I know this is hard to do, but young people, remember when you used to go to a place called school? Yeah, it, it used to exist, and maybe someday we'll come back to it. Uh, but when you would go to this thing called school, there was a thing called lunch. And at lunch, you sit at a lunch table with your friends. And you have a circle of influence there among those friends. There among those friends, you have an opportunity to lead them and make wise choices so that they'll look at you and say, there's something different about you. Yes, I'm a Christian. And as such, I pursue and I live a wise life. Your friends on that sports team that you used to play on, those sports will come back. Great opportunity for you to lead there. The school bus that you ride on, great opportunity for you to lead there. Moms and dads, wow. We are, we are hopefully enjoying and making the most of homeschool, home quarantine, and the insane amount of time that we, are, that we have. This is an opportunity for us to be with our families. It's an opportunity, not an obligation. It's an opportunity. It's a blessing. And it's an opportunity for us to step into their lives and to lead, and to lead with wisdom. Moms and dads, the, the children we are raising, to pursue wisdom and to make the right choices. This is something I struggle with. I don't get this one right. But to, but to be a wise leader in my home, that's something that I desire. Grandmas and grandpas, to, to wisely lead your grandchildren, those around you. We will come back to your house. <laughs> that sounds like a threat, but we will be back. We will come 
We will fill your home for Thanksgiving dinner with all of our grandchildren running amok. We'll, we'll be back. We will. We'll make it. And we look to your, your leadership and your wisdom and how you can guide us. This is, this is the benefit that, that wisdom benefits those around us. Solomon asked for wisdom because he saw the job at hand. He looked at the nation before me and said, I can't do this. I need your help. Parents, do you remember that day when you first brought your child home from the hospital and, and, you, and you looked at your wife and, and I remember when we took Joe home and I thought, they're going to let us leave? Do they know how underqualified I am for this thing? I have no idea for this thing, for this child. I have no idea what I'm doing. You got this one. We'll see you at round two. And, and they're both alive, so we're doing really good. Okay, we're doing good. But talk about feeling underqualified. To pursue wisdom and knowledge so that I can lead and be a good dad, and a good husband. I need to put the Bible at the forefront. I need to ask God to give that to me. And that's the good thing about it. If you're in first, or excuse me, Second Chronicles, put a bookmark here. And go over to James chapter 1. All the way back in the New Testament. James chapter 1. All the way back in the New Testament. Um, God tells us, he specifically tells us in his word, James 1, 5, to ask God to give you wisdom. To ask for it. James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, it might not just magically come imparted to us and we're, we're, we're wise right like that. You might have to use the abilities that God has given you to study, to read, to learn, to listen to wise people, to surround yourself with wise people who you let speak into your life, to learn from their mistakes, but we pray and we ask God to give us wisdom and he'll give us wisdom. And that's his, that's his words. That's his desire. He wants to generously give us wisdom so that we'll be able to make the right decisions in this, this global pandemic that we're living in. This, this, is, this is something that I think we need to be pursuing at the forefront is wisdom. The ability to, to, to make the right decisions, to ask for wisdom, to ask God to give us wisdom. That's, um, oh, I, I do not envy the governor, Governor DeWine. I do not envy the president, the medical experts, uh, Fauci, Dr. Fauci, uh, President Trump, Mike, Dr. R, excuse me, Vice President Pence. The, the, the responsibility on their shoulders to, to protect life and to stop this pandemic and at the same time to answer the question of, of, of joblessness. Millions of Americans out of a job. I was talking with one of my friends and he had to... He would use up all of his vacation time, and now he's unemployed. And vacation during a global pandemic is not, not very exciting. But that was the lead from his company. And it, I, was, I was disappointed. I, I'd, be a little, I'd be a little upset. I, what's, wow, what's the right thing to do here? What's the correct decision to do here? So, so as, as, as people, as Christians, we need to pray that God will give us wisdom. And I think we need to be on our knees, praying diligently and asking that God would give our leaders of our country wisdom. What is the right, the correct thing to do right now? Because before them, I don't see an A, B, or C, or D, or a true and false questionnaire. It's not that simple. These are challenging questions good, challenging questions that we need wise leadership. So we, we church, need to be praying that our leaders will be surrounded by godly men and women who have a wise and knowledge, a Christ-led heart that makes the best choices. And we need to be praying for that. In the middle of this economy, or uh, this, this pandemic, who should we listen to? What will church look like? We hear lots of complaints and lots of suggestions, but what is the best thing? We had a, a, a board meeting the other day, and we were talking about what church will look like when we're out of this, this lockdown. What will it look like the first time we come together? Well, first off, I'm going to apologize if I forget your name because uh, I haven't seen you for two months. Hopefully I won't. 
Uh, but my name's Mike. Nice to meet you. Uh, but, but what will it look like when we come back, when we get to meet together as God's people in his house collectively and worship together? I'm excited. I look forward to that day. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. But what will it look like? What will be the new wise thing? I, I, I think about the old Western movies. You remember the old Western movies? When you'd have the, the guy who was a, a rancher, and then you'd have the guy in town, and the rancher comes to town with, with six cows, and he wants to sell some of his cattle. And so he's talking to this guy who's going to buy them, and he's going, oh, I'm going to sell these cows for this much money. And the other guy goes, that's, a, that's too high. Why don't you bring that price down? And so they haggle the price out, and they finally they, they agree on the price. And he goes, okay, the cows are yours for this much money. He goes, all right, here's the money. And he goes, put her there, and he puts his hand out. What's he doing in his hand in those old Western movies? You remember? You get a little, and you put it in your hand, and you shake hands on it. Spit in your hand. I'm glad that that's something uh, that as a society we have left behind. That, that, that needed to be left behind. Uh, at the end of, of 1 Peter, there's a verse where it, t- it talks about greeting each other with a holy kiss. Again, something culturally that I'm glad that has been left behind. But what will the future of the church look like? Like one of my favorite things about being here at church is, is, is welcoming people. Hi, welcome to Defines Christian Church and shaking people's hands. Note to self, I don't spit in my hand before I shake hands, okay? Except for one person. No, I'm totally joking. I'm totally joking. But, but will handshakes be gone? Will hugs be gone? Can, can we not? What will be the wise choice? What will be the future? I met someone the other day, and I was talking with him, and, and he put his hand out to shake my hand. I thought, you know what's going on? You can't do that. But I didn't respond that way. I just shook his hand. I introduced myself. I acted pre-COVID. And the kids were watching. They were watching this, this whole thing unfold, and their eyes just got huge. And they're like, Dad, no way. I can't believe you're doing that. I said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Because when he left, I went inside quickly, and boom, they're like, I wash my hand. But what will the future be like? We need wisdom. We need godly knowledge. We need to know what the future will look like. We need to ask God for this. And we need the strength to apply it. Ask God to give you wisdom and give you the strength to apply it. I think think this, this pursuit of godly wisdom is applicable all the time in our life. That we know the right choice, the right decision to make. But especially at this time during this, this, this COVID-19. Uh, but I think we need the strength, the, the strength to apply it at all times. Because if we go back to that verse in, in 1 Chronicles, uh, excuse me, 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Um, the rest of the story there, as Ezra's finishing up, talking about um, Solomon's life. God asked him, what do you want? And, and Solomon says, I want wisdom. And God's like, that's a great answer, great answer. And, um, and he blesses Solomon. But look at verse 14, 14 and 15. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities, also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar, as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. What's the problem with that? Well, it goes on later to talk about how he imports and exports these horses and these chariots. See, Solomon's day, horses and chariots, that was a battle tank. That was military power. And Solomon's in the middle of an arms race, selling military strength, selling weapons. If you remember the first king of Israel, who's the first king of Israel? It's Yahweh God. And who fights for Israel? It's God. But now Solomon's doing just like the people and looking around him and saying, Well, what do you got? Oh, you got horses and chariots. Well, I want horses and chariots. And so Solomon compromises. And he starts to collect horses and chariots to put his trust in horses and chariots. I thought we were supposed to put our trust in in God. But some put their hope and their trust in horses and chariots. He, he puts gold and silver as common as the stones. Money and expensive things are just everywhere. Is that the way that we should treat money? Go in your Bibles. Go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 11. 
this is, uh, this is one, of the, one of the big disappointments about King Solomon's life. The wisest man ever, but I don't think he had the strength to apply it or he was too focused on one area. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what, what happened, but something happened and it went downhill bad and fast. Little compromises. Look at, look at 1 Kings 11. Now remember, 1 Kings tells the same thing as Chronicles does. They're just repeating the same story. 1 Kings 11, 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edenites, Sidonites, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their God. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast in love with them. He failed. He pursued military power and horses and chariots. He pursued women. And they turned his heart from God. And he pursued money. If you go all the way back, all the way back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Now this is before Solomon. This is before Solomon. This is when they're getting ready to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 17. When you enter the land, chapter 17, verse 14. When you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, and you've taken possession of it and settled in it, you shall say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God has chosen. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire a great number of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get them. Well, that's exactly what Solomon does. For the Lord your God has told you you're not to go back the way that you came. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. That's exactly what Solomon did. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. That's exactly what Solomon did. These are the exact same things. This was supposed to be written down. Okay, you're supposed to write this down and, and, and keep this in front of him. Keep this in front of the king. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. And it leads him astray. He was so wise in one aspect, in the economic aspect of making the, the physical kingdom of Israel survive and thrive. But in his personal life, he failed. An expert in one area, but a failure in the next. As Christians, we need to pursue wisdom, godly wisdom, godly knowledge, and we need to excel in all areas of our life. The, the Christian life, the, the wisdom that God gives us should completely permeate our life. We should knock it out of the park at work. We should excel at home. We should excel in our, our parenting. We should excel in the way we treat our spouse. We should excel in making wise, godly choices. I have a lot of work to do, but I'm not giving up. I want to make the best choice possible. And so I'm going to ask God for wisdom. Now, during this time of this global pandemic, and when we leave this time, we will. We'll overcome this. But at the heart of it, I pray that we can be reminded to pursue godly wisdom and knowledge. God, thank you that you give that, that wisdom and that insight and that understanding to us. And I pray that we will be able to learn and lead and apply that in our life to put that into my personal life as well. We thank you that you give generously to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray. Amen. Church, we have, um, we have lots of opportunity right now to make a difference. So I pray that, um, that we can use this opportunity to do that, to make that difference. And uh, one family this week, they contacted me and they said that their son would like to be baptized. And so they came this week. And we kept our social distancing, don't worry. And uh, Clayton Cottrell uh, put his faith in Jesus Christ and was baptized. So I pray that you will uh, be encouraged. Uh, and, and the next time we see this family, encourage this young man as well as he pursues his faith in Jesus Christ. And, and if, if you've never made that decision... If you've never made that decision, listen, we will work out the details. I will wear a mask, you will wear a mask, and we will, we will explain the gospel message, and, and we will bring you back into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. 
So give us a call if you have anything that's on your mind. If you want to know who Jesus Christ is, you want to know more about salvation, please give me a call. Make it a great week in the Lord. Clayton Cottrell, um, please repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ. Is the Son of the true living God. Is the Son of the true living God. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stand in that place Free and